Oh, Jesus Christ. Our ancestors, they came with the, with the horses. To get to Riga, it took 100 kilometers, it took two days, and that means that you cannot go faster. And that's important thing. So you need to stop, to socialize, and then to go to the next place. So you cannot drive, like just put the fuel and drive some 800 kilometers because you need to do it. It's unhuman. When you need to go from point to point and start to think that I will need to stop here, I will need to recharge. And by the way, maybe I can get to know somebody, get to see how they live here. So it's better for the communication between the people because this communication nowadays is lost mostly. Let's go to collect some mushrooms. <laughs> Okay. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. This is airplane. 100. <laughs> 100 in two seconds. That's what we thought about. Yeah, yeah. to the forest and collect something, it opens so many doors in our brain. And we are collectors and we are hunters. That's what we, we came of. This is a World Cup in mushroom picking. Very beautiful. It's like gravity doesn't exist anymore, you just do whatever you imagine. Just go and, and feel the wind and throw your body around, like, yeah. yeah once you we get don't. the feeling of it, how the wind works and how it uh, affects your body, you can just use it unlimited. We had a couple movies. Uh, the first one, which was a couple years ago, was uh, with Tom Cruise, uh, Mission Impossible. Tom was actually doubling Hollywood stars. This is so cool. Like, this is really cool. <laughs> like, the brakes is so enjoyable, really. Like, I could only like, drive like this to Riga, like, you know? <laughs> Just accelerating and braking. <laughs> What I enjoy is that we don't have lots of people in our country. A lot of uh, trails and uh, I would say a lot of places that are untouched. Yeah, like yeah, people yeah, haven't yeah. Uh, ruined it. We traveled with a car and we stopped and we saw these ruins. It was ruins in that time. And we just came in and immediately we understood that this is our place. Industrial Soviet type pumping station. I fulfilled my old dream. My best book in my childhood was uh, Mystery Island by Jules Verne. It's about Captain Nemo and, and Nautilus uh, submarine. And, and here we put some imaginated part of, of this submarine made from stainless steel. Just to contrast with this house, which is covered by cotton steel, which rusts and, and stays nice brown. Loft living, it is the way of 
but the way of living. And nowadays, people, really creative people, try to live in uh, these um, unusual conditions. To live here, that is outstanding. That's, that's not traditional. Traditional houses are at the waterfront, and you have these small windows, and you go over the dunes to the sea. But here, sea is here. I want to die here, I said already. This dramatic change is what happened in Latvia, in former Soviet Union, of course made my life very, very interesting. Because in 1990 we regained independence and I became Director General for the Department for Foreign Economic Relations in Cabinet of Ministers. I became Minister for State Reforms. I became Prime Minister. Man had to change his life in five years and then start something else. And I actually followed this rule. Latvians are quite calm and we like guests. Not maybe so much as Georgians, <laughs> but, but still uh, uh, welcoming. The Latvian landscape and wood, to go into the, for, to see the sea, to go into wood. <laughs> to look at the sky. And uh, uh, our color is gray. A uh, thousand shades of grey. <laughs> Sorry. This uh, radio telescope was built in 1964. It was built for Soviet Union Army purposes, mostly for observations for another military object and also uh, for space observations. It's more like a submarine because uh, most of the parts, including the staircases, were borrowed from uh, USSR time uh, warships and submarines. Uh, for example, the system which gets this telescope moving is actually a gun turret from a ship with a cannon. Instead, instead of a cannon, we mount up an antenna and we have a radio telescope. This astronomy research is actually more of a global thing. An international uh, team linking these uh, telescope sites in network can uh, do this kind of research. It maybe doesn't uh, solve anything in particular for people right here in country, but it definitely helps uh, for Latvia to integrate in uh, global research teams. This place might be a sort of a goal to prove that this is a great place and people should come enjoy um, everything. I mean, 
maybe us, maybe the country, maybe the local area. It's a great place. This place was in some ways built on a goodwill. You can come here and uh, you can drink a tea, honey and bread in winter. I left in Latvia in 79. I was 17 years old. I was getting into trouble with my, with my, with my thinking. I was, I was kind of radical. So I was running into problems and troubles with the local authorities that are basically communist. In North America, I was becoming a better skier. Then I was getting better. Then I made a national team. Then I quit the school. Then I went to Olympics. from Latvia about 10 years ago. What was it like getting out of that country? Freedom. <laughs> he showed up at a race and we're like, who is this crazy Latvian? He was one of the young ones coming up that we older ones had to watch because he was doing really well. I was starting to feel really strange and I passed out in the street. And then uh, it turned out that my Olympics were over. We have our own flag now. We have our own anthem. Sometimes in your life, there are just these, these things. They, 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 it's like a puzzle, you know, it comes together. And maybe you work for it, maybe, maybe you challenge it, I don't know. But, but these are the times in your life, and when these things come together, you just do it. Everybody goes across the continent, so we decided to go the other way, from north to south. You see the country and you meet people, you meet rednecks, you meet uh, cowboys on the way, all kinds of people. I'm very proud of my country, of course. I do not agree with a lot of things, and, and I just explained why. I think we, we could be smarter. Latvians were hardworking people. Some damage was done by, by Soviet Union, and now the, the, the modern times, that also. Take me, take me, take me to the next level. Wow. <laughs> hey, it's clean. I'm not used to sitting in the clean cars. Next time I prepare my, my road better for you. Are you ready? Yeah. Holy oh, shit. Yeah, this is fast, man. Why I'm a chef? I love food. I like to cook very much. My first profession was um, conductor of choir, core dirigent, and, uh, but I couldn't finish the school. I was uh, kicked out because I was a bit uh, punk. In culinary, you read the recipes and books, and uh, if you play music, you read the notes. And then after you read all the books and all notes, and you can um, play your own music, or you can cook your own dishes. The Latvian food, if we talk about Latvian food, well, there is some uh, interesting combinations. How we like to eat uh, cucumber, fresh cucumber with honey. I'm not sure that uh, anywhere else people are eating fresh cucumber with honey, but um, we do. We were under so many different kings through the centuries. 
and uh, that influential uh, comes from I mean Germany, Poland, Russia and uh, yeah, Sweden. This is still a land of a big opportunity. It is kind of like a, you know, wild, wild west where you go and, and you can build things from, uh, from scratch. But it's changing quickly. We still have a lot of uh, Soviet mentality. So it's not really that simple. But if you kind of understand, understand how things work, it still is, uh, I think, by, by big part, uh, a land of big opportunity. We have absolutely beautiful nature. We have a lot of empty spaces because uh, on, on this land we live only uh, less than 2 million people. It's 64,000 square kilometers. It's, it's uh, three times bigger as, as Belgium, let's say. The nature is like absorber of all the our instabilization, all the stresses, all, everything. You just go to the forest and calm down. And once you enter the nature, you just go out back in another shape, renewed. Supreme craftsmanship, precision, innovation, tradition. Qualities that epitomize one of sailing's most historic and revered events, the Rolex Swan Cup. This highly anticipated regatta, bringing together more than 90 of the world's finest swan yachts, has got underway on Sardinia's Costa Smeralda after a four-year absence. And from the start, this amazing collection of yachts, big and small, modern and classic, lit up the 21st edition with color and spectacle in perfect sailing conditions. Whilst the majority of the fleet have been sailing scenic coastal courses, the One Design classes have been competing on a windward lured racetrack. With attention on the Club Swan 36 class, making its event debut. G-Spot has made an early impression, but is being chased hard by Farstar. This cutting-edge seafoil design epitomizes Nautil Swan's constant quest for innovation and reflects just how far the mark has evolved since its original 36-foot design of the late 1960s. Also sailing windward lures, the incredibly competitive Club Swan 50 class 
crewed by some of the world's leading tacticians. We're going to drive inside of it. With Balthazar leading the 15-strong fleet after four races. This event bringing together long-standing partners Rolex, Nautor Swan and the yacht club Costa Smeralda has made an enthralling start. Join us again for more updates from the Rolex Swan Cup 2022. Shivani and Leila are heading to Rome to help protect the world's valuable ecosystems and biodiversity when Leila is old enough to make her own trips around the globe. Shivani can offset their carbon emissions before, during and after they travel. But what is carbon offsetting? Carbon offsetting is recognised by scientists and governments and regulators, including the United Nations. Simply, carbon offsetting is a process that allows people or companies to reduce environmental impact by supporting projects that help lower emissions elsewhere. And as if by magic, here's Carrie Harris, Head of Sustainability, to tell us more. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Paul. Now, did I explain that right? Spot on. You've got the job on the sustainability team. Well done. Yes. Each tonne of carbon offset represents the avoidance, removal or reduction of a tonne of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. These offsets are produced by carbon reduction projects and by purchasing offsets, companies like British Airways and you, our customers, are providing essential funds for these projects to run. For example, by supporting the Mayandombe Rainforest Project in the Congo Basin, our offsets are helping protect the world's second largest rainforest. British Airways only works with carefully chosen projects that are certified and verified to international standards. Not only do they avoid, reduce or remove carbon, but they deliver lots of other meaningful benefits to the local community and the environment. The projects are regularly monitored and verified to ensure that the offsets they produce represent true emissions reductions, are permanent, avoid carbon impacts elsewhere and are trackable and not double counted. And by protecting threatened forests and keeping trees standing, the local community is ensuring that carbon stays locked up in the trees and the soil and can continue to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. And in addition to the carbon benefits, the project also conserves the habitats of wildlife and protects biodiversity and also creates new and sustainable livelihoods for local people. Carbon offsetting isn't the full solution to tackling climate change, but it is an effective way to create positive change in the short term and it's an action that we can take now while we're working on scaling up the longer term solutions to help decarbonise aviation. Hi Paul. Hi Carrie. Welcome on board. Thank you. Should I take my seat? Of course you can. Thanks. Using an onboard Speedbird CAF app, you too can make a contribution to offsetting projects right from your seat. And if you're travelling even further with us, you can offset your flight online using our in-flight Wi-Fi.
What I tend to look for when I go to places are things that are visually appealing. When you walk down the sand dunes here in St. Lucia, just thinking of the old shipwrecks or the explorers, the first thing they saw was these long beaches and impenetrable forest. They still look exactly the same. I can't imagine there are many places in the world where you can see tons of things in one day. I want to pinch my arm and say, this can't be true. I'm in the middle of this. I think the uniqueness is that it's diverse. You could peel off layer after layer and you'll find more and more things. It's all here for you to just be part of. October 13, 1792. In the District of Columbia, the cornerstone is laid for the executive mansion, what we now call the White House. Its first occupants, President John Adams and his wife Abigail, move in when construction is nearly complete some eight years later. 1925. I'll strive unceasingly to try to fulfill the trust and confidence that the British people have placed in me and the things in which I believe. Margaret Thatcher. Britain's first female prime minister is born in Grantham in eastern England. Dubbed the Iron Lady, the conservative Thatcher dominates British politics during more than a decade in power. 1903. In Boston, the first modern World Series in Major League Baseball ends in victory for the home team. The Boston Americans shut out the Pittsburgh Pirates 3-0, clinching the series 5 games to 3. 1974. The city never has witnessed the excitement stirred by these youngsters from Liverpool. Ed Sullivan, the longtime TV variety show host, dies in New York at age 72. And 1941, Paul Simon, singer, songwriter, and musician, is born in Newark, New Jersey. Today in History, October 13th, Carlotta Bradley, The Associated Press. Welcome back in our studio and in today's news, 